Muscle Dr. Liam here, and today we're gonna to take a look at the anatomy of the ankle. So we begin at the deepest layer, and we've got the bones of the ankle. We're gonna begin with the tibia. This is what we all know as the shin bone. Next to that, we've got the fibula, and you'll see that the fibula is a lot thinner than the tibia. So tibia being the main of the weight-bearing bones of the lower leg, that articulates with a bone called the talus. The articulation of these two bones together gives us the movements of the ankle, or two of the four, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So plantar flexion being a tiptoe, dorsiflexion being the opposite, i.e. bringing the toes to the knee. Underneath the talus, we've got the calcaneus, and the articulation of the talus with the calcaneus gives us inversion and eversion, and this joint is called the subtalar joint. So inversion being that one where you roll your ankle, likely to damage some ligaments if you do that, and eversion being the opposite. Not much range of motion available into eversion, and you'll see why as we look from the front with the height of the two different malleoli, which are the uh, bony prominences or bony projections of the medial tibia and the lateral fibula. So it's easier to come around into inversion than it is into eversion. As we come around underneath the foot, Back to the calcaneus again, we all know this is the heel bone and the plantar flexors, or most of them, insert into the back just here via the calcaneal or Achilles tendon. This is the first of what we call the tarsal bones. And the tarsal bones are this collection of bones just underneath the talus in this area. You'll see the first of those is the navicular. So the navicular feeds into three other smaller bones that you'll see just there we call the cuneiforms. We've got the medial cuneiform, the intermediate, and then the lateral cuneiform. Just off to the side, we've got the cuboid, which is a common bone for suffering stress fractures uh, in runners, usually. You'll see there that the cuneiforms feed in to metatarsals. And this is where the tarsals end and the metatarsals begin, and we call that the Liz Frank joint between the midfoot and the forefoot. We've got metatarsal of the first digit, second, and third that all come directly from these cuneiform bones. Then the cuboid feeds into fourth and fifth metatarsal. Those metatarsals continue down and begin the toes, and we call those phalanges. Here we've got the proximal phalanx of the first toe. And the first toe, often called the great toe or the hallux. And hallux will come up as we start to look at the muscles of the toes. We've got the distal phalanx as we've only got the two bones of the big toe. The rest of the four digits have three phalanges and we call those proximal, intermediate, and distal. Now there are lots of ligaments down there as well. A general rule of thumb is anywhere that there are two bones together, there's probably going to be a ligament that connects the two. And the two sets that we're going to focus on here are the lateral ankle ligaments, the ones on this side of the ankle. And the reason for that, as we described earlier on, uh, because of the anatomy and the physiology of the ankle joint itself, it's much easier to give yourself an inversion sprain than it is an eversion sprain. So an inversion sprain, the lateral ankle ligaments will be damaged. The lateral ankle ligaments, we've got the anterior talo fibula ligament. So the ligament that connects the talus to the fibula. It's all in the name, right? Then we've got the calcaneo fibula ligament, connects the calcaneus to the fibula. And if we've got an ATFL anterior, we've probably got a PTFL, which is the posterior talo fibula ligament. We've got a group of ligaments around the medial aspect of the ankle. We call these the deltoid ligaments, not to be confused with the deltoids. There is more connected tissue down there as well. Before we start to add any further layers on, let's add that connected tissue and see what happens. So you can see here, we've got a few different things going on. We've got an interosseous membrane, which is just a membrane that kind of keeps the tibia and fibula together. We've also got the tibiofibular joint and ligaments that connect the two. This other tape-like stuff down this end is what we call retinaculum. Retinaculum, the collar and cuffs of the human body. This keeps the tendons all tucked in, and we'll add that back on again later on so you can see how the tendons all come into play. It allows fluid movement between tendon and bone and stops them from uh, sticking out all over the place. So let's continue to build up those layers, and we're gonna go with the deepest layer of muscles. The first thing that we'll see back here is this muscle which is often forgotten about, and we call that tibialis posterior. It's on the back of the tibia. It plantar flexes, so tiptoes, but also inverts. And we can see how that might happen by its uh, medial line where it comes down underneath the foot, 
just there. So this makes up the first of the three muscles that come just inside the medial malleolus that we call Tom, Dick, and Harry. So we've got Tom, let's see if we can find Dick and Harry. There's Dick, flexor digitorum longus. So tibialis posterior is Tom, flexor digitorum longus is Dick. And as you might guess by the name, this flexes the toes. Would you have ever thought that the muscle that flexes the toes comes all the way up, almost to the knee? Uh, it's quite unbelievable when you see it. It's easy to forget about, even as a therapist. That's Dick. Let's have a look at Harry. We've got flexor hallucis longus. And we call them Tom, Dick, and Harry because they go in order of Tom, Dick, and Harry from the medial malleolus back around to the calcaneus. And they go underneath the foot and control big toes, hallux, and the other digits there as well. So on this level, we're gonna take a look at this group of muscles on the lateral aspect of the leg. We've got fibularis longus, otherwise known as peroneus longus. And if there's a longus, there's gonna be a brevis. So there's fibularis brevis. The two together are often called peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, together called the peroneals. Depends on where you are and uh, where you've learned from, what you read as to whether you call them fibularis or peroneals. Uh, but the two terms are interchangeable. Fibularis may make more sense because of the bone that they connect to. These muscles being on the lateral aspect, either the ankle. But why would we have two? Well, the first of the two, fibularis brevis, attaches onto the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal, just down there. But peroneus longus has a slightly more convoluted root. Let's follow the, follow the tendon as we come underneath the foot and we can see the insertion just there on the base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. This muscle can um, add to the arch of the foot, and if it's dysfunctional, it can cause a flat foot or overpronation. So it's worth looking at this muscle due to its insertion and the root of the tendon, if that's the case. As we look further round to the front, we can see extensor hallucis longus clues in the name, it extends the big toe. Now, the, the confusion here comes from the fact we've discarded of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, which can be fairly confusing names for the two actions of the ankle uh, in the sagittal plane, and we've gone for extension. You'll just have to remember in this case that extension means dorsiflexion. I know it's confusing. Plantar flexion means flexion. So we've got extensor hallucis longus. You can see it crosses the ankle joint, therefore it must act on it. Not only does it extend the big toe, but it also dorsiflexes the ankle. We add the next layer on there and we've got extensor digitorum longus. So just like the flexors of the toes, have a look at how far this muscle belly comes up the shin. Often forgotten about, but it is quite a substantial muscle belly. And that again crosses the ankle at the front. Muscles only shorten, brings insertion closer to origin, therefore it dorsiflexes the ankle. Further around to the back and we've got the soleus. Soleus is the first of the two big calf muscles. Uh, not to be forgotten about, again, it sits underneath the more superficial gastrocnemius and it plantar flexes the ankle. You've got a strong insertion point via the Achilles tendon onto the calcaneus. The Achilles tendon, otherwise known as the calcaneal tendon, if you hear it referred to as that. Um, but crucially, it doesn't, it doesn't cross the knee. So it doesn't act on the knee. It's posterior, so it plantar flexes the ankle. And if we truly want to isolate soleus away from gastrocnemius, all we need to do is flex the knee because this makes gastrocnemius less efficient at what it does and allows us to target soleus. Soleus often referred to as the second heart of the body because of the way that it can increase blood flow back up via venous return. As we come around back to the front, we're going to add on the next layer and you'll see the final muscle on the superficial layer of the anterior lower leg tibialis anterior. So we mentioned earlier on peroneus longus and it's convoluted root under the foot to help give some structure to the arch of the foot and its insertion point on the base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. The reason that I mention all that now is because tibialis anterior actually inserts onto the same spot. The two are antagonistic in every way. So where tibialis anterior dorsiflexes, peroneus or fibularis longus plantar flexes. Where tibialis anterior inverts the ankle, fibularis longus or peroneus longus everts the ankle. So it's important that we've got harmony, balance, um, and some kind of length tension relationship between the two. They can both play a part with maintaining a good arch of the foot. 
So keep that in mind if that's something that you're seeing or struggling with. Then as we move posteriorly, there's the one, that's the calf. When we think calf, when we see a calf, that's what we think of, isn't it? That's the gastrocnemius. We've got the medial head and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius into a big muscular tendinous junction down into the Achilles tendon. And this muscle, unlike soleus, does cross the knee, so it, therefore it must act on it. It flexes the knee. So we've got the eight plantar flexors of the ankle. But hold on a second, we're missing one. That would be plantaris. So plantaris vestigial, not everyone's got one. And um, those that have, you will have them at different levels of development. If you can palpate it, you're doing incredibly well because they're very difficult to palpate. You can see the muscle belly there at the back of the knee also crosses the knee so it flexes it, albeit weakly. We've got the long, long, long tendon that hugs slice all the way down and it does contribute to plantar flexion of the ankle. So there's the anatomy of the ankle. We will take a quick look at the foot and we'll have a look at the flexors. So we've got flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and we've also got a lot of other muscles there in the foot, which we're not gonna go into at this stage, but just know that they are all in there, and if they're on the plantar surface, or the bottom of the foot, they're gonna flex the toes. If they're on the dorsal surface, so top of the foot, they're gonna extend the toes. We've got the insertion of some of these smaller muscles as well into the calcaneus. So that insertion point onto the anterior calcaneus there, if we get irritation or inflammation, that can result in something you may have heard of called plantar fasciitis. And if we're treating that, we probably need to strengthen some of those tendons. That is the anatomy of the ankle. I hope you enjoyed. It's a fairly brief look. I might do something more detailed at some point in the future. I'd love to hear your comments. Please like and subscribe and engage and all that stuff helps the channel, helps me. I've really enjoyed doing this. I hope you have too. See you soon.